Pampere's music, I think that we may need to reevaluate your, your life eating status. <laughs> Pampere's writing work has appeared in several, several, several magazines, including Jalata and Africa as a Country. She is also the co founder of the art installation Saloni, which has traveled all over the world. And she is she has been described as one of East Africa's most exciting young DJs. So <laughs> Africa's actually. <laughs> um, and then right here we have Edna Ninsima who is Edna is filling in for Mr. Ronald Mainja, who unfortunately um, couldn't make it last minute. Edna is a feminist, um, a communications expert, an author of a short story also, which you know was just published and part of the organizing team of writing visit. So a hand clap for the panelists. <laughs> right, so we're just going to like delve straight into the hard questions, right? <laughs> I'm going to begin with you, Harriet. In your writing, you know, how do you imagine freedom in your work? What does that look like when you're writing and you're writing all these amazing short stories and what does the reimagination of freedom mean? particularly look like for you? Okay, uh, thank you for that question. So, the way I look at it is that the act of writing itself is freedom. Because if I'm not able to write, then I'm not free. Um, but when you go into the actual content of what you're producing, then freedom means that you are able to say things without thinking. Um, will I arrive home safe without being kidnapped by some people who, you know, uh, work for those who do not want your work out? Um, it's about... Um, writing something and not being afraid of what the reaction will be, including from uh, those who will read your work or those who will interact with your work. Um, it's also about um, being open to the different ways in which your work will be received. So yes, that's, that's how I imagine freedom to be. back and forth. Edna, I want to come to you next because you've written quite a lot on sort of reimagining freedoms in this country, not just political freedoms really, but freedoms for women and sexual minorities. And you have also come under quite some backlash from people who have not appreciated your work. So Harry talks about not being afraid, right? So, but I'm sure that you must have encountered times when you have been attacked for the work that you have done, right? So how do you navigate that as a writer? How do you put the fear on the back end and just continue to do the work that you're doing? Um, well, I think that any artist has the responsibility, really, the duty to um, uh, fight for these freedoms. And I know that, uh, of course, a writer decides, for example, a writer or a painter or a musician decides that this is what I want to use my art for. But I think I end up said before that art will bring us to the revolution because uh, if you can uh, produce something that people enjoy but also communicate a message that uh, is revolutionary, then that's just a win, yeah? How I navigate uh, that, I don't, I don't want to lie and say, uh, you know, people say, you're so brave, you're so, you're a strong woman, yeah? I, and I am. Yeah, I yeah. am. Uh, but uh, I, there's never a time where I'm just like, oh, no, I don't fear. Like, I'm, I'm not afraid of uh, backlash. I am not afraid of, uh, of uh, uh, how this would be perceived, how people will then start to interact with me or see me, uh, which is not really an issue, but there's never a time when it's, the fear is it's completely not there. So for me, how I navigate that is, is the thought that it's never about me, yeah? So it's never about me. It's about a bigger cause, much bigger, bigger cause than, than, than um, I am. And because 
I see these women as a writer. Uh, I will speak as a writer because, yeah, well, that's who I am. I see women like Toni Morrison. I see uh, the Audrey Lords. I see uh, people who are women who have come before, and Richie Chimamanda even, yeah? I see Godiva with your story in uh, the Right of a Zim Anthology. And these women have come out and, and created uh, and spoken these issues regardless of uh, who is going to talk to them, how, or what they're going to, um, what feedback they're going to receive. So there are all these examples. There is community yeah there's not we are not coming from i'm not coming from a time where i'm just like i'm the first person to do it so it might it might be you know most scary on if it was that way but there are people who have done it before and it's bigger it's much much bigger than i am it's for a bigger cause it's not about me that's how i navigate right um Kampire, as a dj do you think that music is a vehicle for activism in this country um, I, I do. Uh, I think that it's a very poignant time to be having this conversation. Um, one of the um, forms of activism that uh, people in Kampala have chosen, I've been reading about radio DJs who have chosen to play Bobby Wine's song, um, his music, every 15 minutes. And I think that's a really powerful form of activism. Um, especially in Uganda where because of culture and because of the political situation we have to navigate forms of protest um, in, in specific ways. So we might not necessarily be as overt in our choice of protest and we um, might have to choose to, to um, be a bit circumspect in our choice of protest but it, it, there's a lot of power in music, music unites people, um, and music speaks in ways that words do not. So um, they, it communicates beyond language, um, it communicates beyond class, um, and it's a very powerful way in which to mobilize um, people's sentiments. And I think that every person here can think of an example in which music has been used to galvanize protest, to bring people together, whether you're talking about Bobby Wine or Bob Marley or, or you know, um, Philly Lutaya, uh, um, music has always been a vehicle for, for that kind of thing. Right. Um, and to you now, Joshua, right, as an author and as a playwright, how do you think that your work contributes to the legacy of collective freedoms um, in Uganda? Um, thank you so much. Um, most of my writing is um, actually to do with uh, social justice. And um, I didn't know until I started looking at uh, uh, the poems I've written and um, the three plays I have written. So the one that was uh, produced recently, The Betrothal, um, and then I've written another play called God of Small Hands and another one um, This the land is ours too, which looks at uh, uh, land rights, especially for women uh, in Africa um, and other places where uh, um, Hereditary rights are a problem for women um, so uh, just looking at um, uh, most of the, the writings that I make, I, I look at uh, two uh, of all freedoms. I'm, I consider uh, freedom from uh, want and uh, freedom from fear as the most important because if you're free from want, it means you have the ability to do so many things without being restricted by uh, um, the you know the lack of uh, the resources that you need to do what you want to do and uh, freedom from fear um, is basically to do with uh, uh, what um, authorities or other people in your environment may impose on you making it uh, difficult for you 
to express yourself, to do things that, you know, you, 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 you have this right you are born with to do whatever you want to do as long as you're not um, infringing on other people's freedoms or rights. So if you can do whatever you want to do without a fear of retribution, then um, that is important to me. So as a writer, um, a lot of my poetry, I'm looking at things like that. I've written a poem called Pandagari in English. So we all know uh, things that are happening. Within the context of Uganda right now, you go back in history, you will be told that uh, there are people who bore arms, went to the bush, so that they would free us from, uh, you know, um, this fear of uh, being uh, thrown in the back of a pickup truck and driven to unknown places. Uh, but uh, what is happening right now, this is happening, only this time they don't say Pandagari, they say get into the car, get in the car. So it's, what has changed is the language of expression, but uh, that fear is still there. How many people, for example, can express themselves freely on uh, social media on the matters that are affecting us daily? You see, some people think, oh, you'll be taken away into some unknown place. So I write about these things. Um, God forbid one day I get picked up, but, well, I'll be paying the price. So many people have paid the price, but yeah. So without uh, belaboring the point, I think um, uh, my writing addresses those two main issues of freedom. Freedom from fear, freedom from want. If you look at the play that I wrote, we have a woman, um, the play that was produced rather, a woman in a village who's struggling to get basic vaccines for her baby because someone in a position of authority or who would have made it possible for her to get the vaccines has denied her that chance to get the vaccine. So she is in constant want. She can't get her baby the basic medicines the baby needs. What is the most important right for any human being? Right to life, right? If this baby dies, someone has denied that baby the right to life, the most important of all rights. And um, so my play, uh, which you've uh, spoken very nicely about, thank you, addresses that issue. So again, it comes to freedom from want and freedom from fear. Thanks. Well, we're still on the subject of, of being picked up. Um, Harriet, I want to ask you, right, in given Uganda's context, and, and I'm speaking specifically about Bobby Wine, what does the use of art as a tool for solidarity look like in this particular context? How do artists come together and rally to support their fellow artists? That's an interesting one. Uh, I'm yet to see a collective, um, a collective petition or a collective statement from artists regarding what is happening to Bobby Wine right now. I know that he's now an MP, but he still is a musician. So what that for me says is that uh, we, need, we need more people to come up, to speak up um, at, at times when, um, when things are hard, when it's not easy to speak up. Um, so I'll just make reference to um, the time when the LRA, the Lord's Resistance Army um, insurgency was still um, prevalent in northern Uganda. And I remember my undergraduate uh, research was, it assessed the role of music uh, in restoring peace in northern Uganda. And it was interesting to see how uh, the people I spoke to in my KII I say they feel relieved, uh, they feel uh, a sense, a, a feeling of catharsis after listening to music because in a situation of war like that, people feel afraid, they, they, they don't talk much, 
but when you have your radio and you're listening to a song which is calling those in captivity to come back home, then you know you feel some you feel some hope. But also, um, it showed that you know there's power in music, and I think from that period to now, a lot of artists from northern Uganda rally around the issues that affect them, the issues that affect society. And uh, I think that one of the most controversial musicians from, from the north, um, uh, he's called Bosmiko Tim, who sang about Museveni in very unflattering terms and was threatened and I think he was even arrested. He, col he collaborated with Bobby Wine and they did a song uh, not so long ago, I think about two months ago. And for me, that showed the importance of collaboration. That when you see someone being, their freedom being taken away because they've expressed themselves, you don't um, sort of add fuel to the fire and say, you know what, tone it down. You don't say that. You, you show them that you're there for them. You show them that you're doing the right thing. Otherwise, you will start questioning ourselves. Am I overstepping my boundaries? Am I imagining the problems that we are seeing? Because other people are not, are not doing anything. So that is what I want to see us, I want to see as writers and artists do, uh, speak out more about what's happening and not, not cower because that is what uh, those who are taking away our freedoms want to silence. Many of the panelists have talked about just the importance of music and art, right? And yet, in this particular instance, there seems to be no collective action. There seems to be no sort of like collective solidarity from artists. I'm, and I hate to put you on the spot, Edna, but you know, here you are. I would like you to perhaps think through why that is. Why do we feel like when one of the top um, freedom musicians is is held captive, that there's no co quick collective action from artists to say we demand the immediate release of, of this person? Um, so I'm, I'm thinking two things, yeah? One, uh, when a young man is shot in the head and uh, a couple of other activists are arrested and dehumanized, I feel like it's beyond um, the, the action is to, one of the reasons for those actions is to send a message. So to kind of uh, uh, instill fear in, in the public and say, you know, you could be like, don't dare do this, because if you do, this is how you will end up. Uh, so I, we can't um, ignore the fact that many Ugandans now have worries, but more than ever today live in that fear of if Bobby Wine, who is a member of parliament, a considerably influential uh, Ugandan, a freedom fighter, somebody who is loved by so many people, can be beaten to almost oblivion. What is going to happen if I, Ninsima, uh, got up today and said, you know this, you know, and said some uncomfortable things, so that, number one. But also, too, I felt like there's some form of collective apathy in Uganda where I don't know whether it's because it's how we have been conditioned. We look at certain issues as that's not our issue. You hear people say something like, I don't deal with politics. Uh, I'm not concerned with those things, but how can politics, how can governance not concern you, a Ugandan living in Uganda, operating in this country? So I, I, th I feel that maybe that comes from a kind of conditioning where we think uh, the leaders do that. Um, in the recent campaign of the, this tax must go, there were people saying that, you know, you guys are protesting for nothing. They have already done it. What, what, what can we do, right? And, and so I think there is a mindset that we need to maybe change, tune, and think of these issues as ours too. So the people stop saying, ah, that's his issue, so it doesn't affect me, because we must know, I don't, and I don't know how we can start to do that. Uh, 
widespread, but also it needs to be urgent to get every gun and to know that you could be next. And if this one is, this is, it can never be one person's issue and not yours. So I think that those two things, first, um, nobody wants to be shot, left with a single gunshot wound to the head. Uh, two, uh, it's just the thought of uh, that the apathy, it's not my issue, it's his issue. He's shouting, let him shout. And if he gets um, beaten, let him get beaten. As long as I'm eating, working out, my children are going to school. Yeah. Right. Um, so, Kampire, talk to us about what it's been like to sort of use your mad DJing skills to create a safe space for minoritized people in this country to not really just to, to just and have a more a, a minute in 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 the midst of just so much homophobia and misogyny to just enjoy life um so i mean none of this was necessarily intentional and i think that this is the thing about politics like edna said people act like they're not involved in politics so they don't want to get involved and yet politics is our life so in becoming a dj and being a person who enjoyed going out who enjoyed nightlife in kampala and in other cities and being a woman um it meant that i was faced with situations in which i felt unsafe or i had to make extra arrangements for my own safety and my friends safety um, particularly women, particularly sexual minorities. Um, and then on becoming a DJ, um, it was necessary for me to stake out the space that I had and to being in an a environment or a community which is majority men, um, you sort of need to, like I said, stake your claim, but also protect your space and, and, and show that you have a right to be there. And in doing that, it, it's natural that I have to do that for other people. Um, and so it became important to me to create spaces in which women, queer people, um, people of, of a variety of backgrounds can come together and enjoy themselves and not be made to feel like they don't belong. Um, and so um, we've done a series of parties, um, myself and you know, other women DJs, but also in the broader community of uh, DJs and people who put on electronic music parties in ensuring that everyone feels comfortable to be there. Because I think that um, something else that is um, a feature of Ugandan society is that it's quite stratified. And so even though we don't necessarily talk about it, uh, Ugandan society is very divided on the basis of class. Um, and I think that, you know, that might be one of the things that has contributed to the apathy that Edna has spoken about. And so beyond making it, in addition to making it more, making uh, nightlife more comfortable for women, in addition to making it more comfortable for queer people, in addition to making it more comfortable for people of all kinds of classes, it's essential that we have a space in which people can get together um, and enjoy music. And I think the political aspect then is, it might not necessarily be the, your immediate goal, but it's in the water. It's, it's something that happens naturally when people get together. And in Uganda, we're getting together in groups of more than, what, six or something? You have to ask police permission. Um, these spaces are very important, and it's very important that everyone has access to them and that people of different kinds can get together. Um, Joshua, Kampiri talks about, you know, getting people together, you know, for sort of a collective action. You have worked with the BBC and currently working with the UN, and here you are on a panel organized by chapter for Uganda, how do we ensure, and, all, and, and just all these you know, traditional media and, and NGOs are all sort of interested in the same thing, collective freedoms, and so is the arts. So how do we begin to ensure that there is sort of a linkage between traditional media 
and international and local um, NGOs and the artists, because usually it seems that you know the art is on one side and all these others are on one side. How do we begin to make that linkage that we all understand that we're working for a collective goal? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I think uh, the most important thing is um, for uh, whoever wants to advance anything for any community or society to try and understand what the needs of that society are. Um, I mean, just quickly talking about collective action. Um, again, the issue that uh, people are nonchalant about um, uh, what is happening in the political space because they think uh, it doesn't touch them. I mean, it's a lie because eventually it comes knocking at your door. It, it's only a matter of time. It, it comes indirectly, so, um, but you know, eventually it does come. But um, going back to uh, the issue of collective action, uh, getting uh, NGOs, uh, international organizations working with uh, um, local communities or entities to advance things. It is important that first of all, when anyone comes from the outside and they want to do things for you, you do not let them appropriate your space and define what you want for you. That, that still is in your hands. And so it's important um, even in the arts for us to, uh, to make sure that we knock home that message of uh, people uh, making sure that their space is their space, they define it. So we want to define what our needs are rather than uh, have someone come from the outside to define our needs for us. And then, um, and then uh, of course, they come uh, they want to work with us because they believe honestly that they would like to, uh, to, to help us advance ourselves. So we, we should welcome them, but at the same time, we should not let them appropriate our space and uh, make it theirs just because they want to, um, to get a few credit points, um, you know, for doing that. So it is our space. And for the arts, especially, I've, I've, I've read uh, a lot of uh, good works of art, and I listen to music. Um, one of the, um, the albums I have on my uh, playlist is uh, Bobby Wine's album. And um, whenever I'm feeling homesick in New York, I listen to this music. And um, without getting into the politics of things, because um, my job won't allow me to speak, and that's part of freedom, won't allow me to speak about um, certain things here. The arts can advance freedoms in an incredible way because they appeal to people in a way that nothing else does. When you sing a song, um, one of the songs that Bobby Wines on, on this album is that even those who hate me, uh, lock up their doors and listen to my music behind closed doors. And this is what the arts do. So even if this guy who is oppressing you doesn't want to, to listen to you say or speak your mind any other way, if you put it in, in a piece of art, they are going to consume it. And somehow, if they, if they keep listening to your music or reading your poem, one day maybe they will listen to the message in there. Um, I know that I, have, I might have uh, wandered off the message, but I just wanted to put that out there. Thanks. Right. So I think we take a couple of questions from the audience. Hello. Uh, my name is Andrew Kagwa. Uh, mine is not a question. It's actually answering something you talked about, uh, why artists are not really coming out. and. It's something I talked about with a fashion designer one time when I was asking if fashion designers have come out to make designs that are communicating different messages. And one of the things I was told is the art industry in Uganda has already been gagged. So many people are afraid of coming out to say anything. And they always feel like 
the more they stay in peace with the system is the more they are safe. That's probably, it probably explains why we do not have this collective action from artists, much as some have come out to talk independently. Uh, my name is Opina Jones. Um, I just wanted to mention something that happened recently in Nigeria when Fowles released his song, This is Nigeria, and we listened to it and we've digested it. Then the NBC, that's the National Broadcasting Commission, just banned the song, like no radio station should play this song again. And surprisingly, some people are coming out and saying, yes, um, he probably just stole childish Gambinos, this is America, and stuff like that. But um, I found myself wondering, why is it that we, okay, let me just say, we Nigerians, especially on the social media space, find it more comfortable when outsiders speak of something that affects us, but when, like, how would I put it, our own people speak of this same thing, we get a bit uncomfortable. For example, Chimamanda is our own, but she lives outside Nigeria mostly. When she talks about feminism, you find that even many people that are uncomfortable with it are like, okay, well, she's making a good point. But when uh, Nigerian says the same thing. People are like, no, 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 no. You are overdoing this feminist stuff. No, ah, your feminism is different. Ah, no, ah, ah. Okay, you want to kill all the men. Okay, you know, stuff like that. So I wonder, why is it that we are comfortable? Because when Chinese Gambino sang, this is America, wow, the Nigerian Facebook space just blew the video out of proportion. But when Faust did this same thing, okay, yes, he mentioned it that this is copied from Chinese Gambino's work, but people kept distracting from the point and saying, ah, this is a stolen work, this is this. So I'm wondering, why is it that we get uncomfortable when we speak of our own problems, but when we hear from outsiders, we are okay with it? I don't know. Does it happen in Uganda? I don't know. And is there, like, a problem with it, or am I just the only one seeing it? Like, am I overdoing it, blowing it out of proportion? Hi, I'm called Godiva. So I have a question for all of you because you're all writers, yeah? So I feel like um, when we talk about freedom, I guess because we are, we are not living in a free country, in a free world, yeah? So we tend to talk about freedom as the agitation for freedom, yeah? So for all of you as writers, outside of the agitation, yeah? Outside of the working towards freedom and the theme of this thing is not there, but people are working for it like this, yeah? What does, let's say, a free character look like in a story that you've written? Or what is, what does a free person look like? Hi, um, this is for all of you. I think we kind of touched on it when Kampira spoke about DJing. Um, but I was wondering uh, to what extent you think that the expression of joy and um, sort of, yeah, freedom and happiness in your work for marginalized peoples is also important, and whether you think that a balance should be struck between, you know, talking about the pain and the difficulties, but also allowing for um, radical joy to be a way in which you you perform your activism. Hi, uh, there's there's always a, a challenge in collective spaces about there's the studies done if there's 20 people who see an injured man none of the 20 will do anything about it. But if there's like two people who see an injured man, they do something about it somehow. Um, so in a space where our, like in the current situation where we're in, where our um, Bobby Wine is inside um, a horrible space, how do we move away using writing, using music? How do we move people from, uh, I forget the psychological term, where you ignore everything because you assume someone else who has seen the hurt person will do something about it, right? How do we move everyone like to that point of you have to give a, a, a fudge, let's go with that, you have to give a fudge about what is happening to other people. 
like how do we move using all the various the writing the music how do we move people from not caring to to that point especially when you can easily stay back thank you artists i want to ask uh our pastors artists and i also want to know that how about the side of artists who who don't speak against government for example right now we have bebe cool who invited a president on his show and he, he does entertainment mean if entertainment becomes politics and we go to club to listen to politics is uh, and we killing entertainment and as artists your messiahs because last time we heard that bob wine has died and they're crazy in kampala and how are you going to limit your extremism because there are pastors who go on, during elections who go into power piece and they say this is the man god has chosen and they are artists so your message how are you going to have control over your message because there's also extremism if you think of Bob Wine, you think of the ghetto you think of bandits and how are you going to have that discipline in 2021 we might have around 40 musicians in parliament and will they really care about the roads will they really care about the dying mothers in the hospitals do we do we, where we are heading do we, shall we have politicians who speak public opinion because i don't think Karama Jones are listening to Kar they are being, they, what the Karama Jones are going through. I don't think there's any artist who's going to speak about the Karama issues. So if a region doesn't have an artist, will they be ever heard in a parliament of speech? In a parliament, if you don't have a Karama Jones artist, will the ideas and the suffering of people in Karama be heard? So how are you going to have an artist who's playing all through, all through the areas? And how are you going to handle the Bebe Cool, who are never politicians? Are you going to hate them? And in, I remember in the elections of 2016, people boycotted their side of the musicians. I said, we shall never go there. And is that a entertainment where we are heading? Is it OK? Are we going to attend clubs that play only Bob Wayne's music? Yet entertainment is meant to relieve and heal us. If it becomes political all of a sudden, shall we have entertainment then? Perhaps we should begin with that question. And I'm going to ask Kampiri to answer because, I mean, you do DJ, and I think that they're holding you personally responsible for playing only Bobby Wine songs. Um, I think that... I think that to imagine that music is just entertainment and exists out of, outside of politics is ridiculous because even someone like Bebe Cool is promoting his own values or the values that he um, subscribes to through his music. So to paint Bobby Wine's music or playing Bobby Wine's music as political and playing Bebe Cool in this particular example as apolitical is a mistake. I think that usually people who are of a minority or opposition point of view are labeled as political and the people who are with the status quo and going with the majority are labeled as neutral and yet they're also promoting their own politics. Um, I want to say a little bit about the question of Uganda's collective apathy because I think it's a conversation we, especially in activist circles, seem to have a lot. Um, why are Ugandans the way we are? Even now, going on Twitter, I'm seeing like Kenyans or South Africans who are like, oh, Ugandans are so docile. We would be in the streets at this point. And I think that rather than sitting here and lamenting and acting like it's something particular about Ugandans, we should go through the reasons. And one is that we have a very violent history of, you know, violent regime change. Um, people with very fresh memories of, of violence that has visited them personally. And the fact that someone doesn't want to send themselves or their sons to go and stand in front of a tank is not something that like, other people should, uh, should laugh at. I think that a second reason is that the state has um, ensured that it has destroyed and disempowered institutions in the country so that you don't have the political power collective power to stand up. If you want to talk about artists um, and look at the collectives and institutions that they do have, um, what political power have they been able to build? Um, Bebe Kool has been given as an example, but we've seen in the past couple of years how the state has um, 
captured a number of popular artists and used their voices to has been done in politics for as long as politics has been done. And I think that the third reason in which the third reason is that artists are apathetic for the same reason that the rest of Ugandans are apathetic and that's because we are all complicit in the system as it stands and in capitalism as it's expressed in Kampala and in Uganda. And therefore, we're like, I don't want to give up my salary. I don't want to go against what my boss's rules are. I don't want to be seen as, spo as speaking out. And I think that instead of lamenting our apathy, we need to name those reasons and start looking at solutions to specific issues. So how are we building institutions that are independent, institutions that are not funded by Western embassies and Western donors, institutions that speak for the majority of people um, and not just you know, a select middle class or an English speaking middle class. Um, we need to move beyond conversation that these are happening. So, let's move to imagine joy. Right? <laughs> and free job. And I want you to speak to Godeka and, and her question. Now, what does a free person look like? What does a free character look like? And, and what does radical joy also look like? Right? Because we'll talk a lot about pain, but there must be something else. And, and as writers and as actors, what does that look like for, for really all four of you? I think that this question all so this is Margie, Rivers, and Sheila's question. Uh, what does a free person look like? I think for me, a free person is if you get to a point in your life where they define you, you beyond the social construct, beyond what your parents expect, beyond how you see him in society or respectability, if you um, go past that and you live the way you want to live, define life for you, as long as of course you're not divorce reasons, then that is what only uh, about uh, uh, writing happy stories for my journalist, but or uh, being artful, happy and not sad and depressed and um, you know it's something that we need to think about. Yeah, and it's interesting because we we're having this conversation the other day when we were recording the Board uh, about the anthology, and uh, it's something that I personally uh, have thought about when I was. Um, Writing my uh, story for a short story for the um, anthology, I wanted to speak about how this country continuously um, dehumanizes and marginalizes uh, people uh, or uh, sexual minorities, and uh, because also I had uh, called out somebody on Twitter. Um, uh, months earlier, and um, it, it, it had become um, the hate that I just received from saying, you know, you cannot take this as a joke, you cannot, uh, you know, laugh at this, and how everybody then started, I became the end of it. It was just a reminder of how again we continue to hold certain people in bondage and how I was just like, no, this is not right. So uh, I thought of having a character, my main character, Nyanguma, the woman supposed to be the queer woman who is uh, dehumanized, who is uh, oppressed. But then I thought about portraying a queer person, looking at the complexity of a queer person. If uh, they are really a person, but how, um, how, what other ways, in what other ways do they exist? So my character 
uh, the, uh, I met then the guy, Fadi, the man, uh, the queer character, but who is, uh, who has social, who is social class is high, who is financially stable, who is uh, also navigating this, um, his situation as a queer person and how he's portrayed, who has found a way to navigate it, uh, through kind of, um, I wouldn't say oppressing, but through um, being a main person to this other girl who is straight, who is now my, my other character is a woman, she's, she's straight, she comes from a poor background, so I lived, I kind of lived the street. So it was to show people that the consequences that uh, for, for us or beyond looking at people and saying, oh, they are like that. Oh, we don't accept them. Okay, what does that mean for us? But also to see these, to see marginalized people up, as people who also have other lives and, and look at the other complexity. And so I think it's something that every artist should to think about and start creating. And then so uh, it's like um, Jamal wrote a song sometime that says, ah, bachala balali. That's he. Bachala balali means women have suffered. Those translation. Uh, and it, it was so annoying to me. I, I'm, I'm a feminist, radical. And so I know all the ways in which women are oppressed. But come on, you can It was the same line. The whole song as just like, you know. <laughs> And I just gave you some spoilers, but still, please buy the book and, and read the entire story. I'm going to let the rest of the panelists respond to the same question. Um, what does freedom and joy look like to me? I, I really appreciated that question, Vidiva, because I agree, we talk about agitation for freedom, but we don't necessarily think about what we don't necessarily live that freedom on a day-to-day -day basis for whatever reason. So for me, freedom means uh, not shaving my armpits and wearing what I want and doing my hair what, the way that I want. And even beyond, here we're talking about you know, political violence and opposition, but even something that is very considered very mainstream in Uganda, something like wearing your natural hair the way it comes out of your head is like a very radical act. Walking downtown in tight jeans or mini skirts because you have ownership of your own body is a very radical act. Um, and, you know, while I don't think that, for me, freedom of speech doesn't mean being free from the consequences of, those, of that speech. It means being free from violence, being free from retribution, as a result of, you know, what my expression of that is. So, you know, sometimes it's just a small thing. Uh, I think that women understand that, being able to, you know, dress yourself, live your life the way that you want to. But it's, uh, it can be a very radical and inspiring act for yourself and for other people around. Um, I think I did mention I did say already what I think freedom for me is freedom from fear and freedom from want. Uh, but um, um, within the context of uh, writing, uh, if, if you haven't, if you did not see the betrothal, you have to see it the next time it's staged. And of the six characters I have, one character is free. And the reason this guy is free is because uh, he do, he's not bothered about what people think of him. He has no girlfriend and he's like, he's cool with that. No one should be asking why he doesn't have one. He doesn't uh, have a lot of money. He, he just has enough to get by, do whatever he, he wants, and that's it. That's one character I've created uh, in my writing. He's very free. Um, but you know, coming back to the issue of artists and why people, for example, are nonchalant about what is going on, um, the whole thing of freedom from want, thinking about source of income, if you're dependent on the state, for example, you're thinking about that time when you'll get a handout of 
uh, 40 million Uganda shillings from uh, the owner of all wealth in Uganda, and you're thinking, oh, I don't want to give up this, so I will not speak. I will not speak up against uh, what is happening. You have no freedom there. So for the artists, you have no freedom if you can't speak up because you're depending on someone for income. Um, and then, of course, the issue of fear. I would like to express anything the way I want to. And uh, the examples that she just gave, I cannot <laughs> overemphasize that. Like a woman can go out and walk with a mini skirt, mini mini skirt if she pleases. If she can do that, she has freedom. If she can't, someone else is trying to define her freedom for her, and that should be unacceptable. Um, and then, uh, of course, can we create art where people are happy? We are a society that is a mixed basket. It's, you want to do that, but it's really difficult to have a, a piece that is completely devoid of pain. So, if you, if you watch the Detroit, this is not my point of reference, you have a lot of laughter. You know, a lot of laughter throughout this play. But then you realize that it cannot be business as usual. This laughter cannot go on when there is a, a serious issue and someone being denied the most fundamental of rights. It has to, to come down to pain and this is where you find yourself mixing up pain with happiness. Um, so, in my writing, um, I portray uh, freedom or happiness in the way my characters defy the norms, in the way my characters go against the established, uh, the established rules. Uh, in, in one of the poems in my collection, A Nation in Labor, there is a woman, there is a persona who uh, stands before the mirror naked and she imagines that her breasts will turn into stones that she can use to feed her husband who beats her every day and comes home drunk, right? And in, a, in the society where it comes from, a woman's nudity is almost something that is entitled to her husband. Right? Um, it's uh, a, a woman's body is looked at as something that is supposed to supply pleasure. But this is a woman who is turning that around and saying, my body can become a weapon for my defense. So that is how I, I explore uh, freedom sometimes in my, um, in my work. I, I want to respond to what the gentleman at the back said about uh, if artists uh, are allowed in parliament, for instance, will they be able to articulate issues to do with our health system, our education system? I think the mistake we make is that artists uh, live in an island alone, right? We come from society, we experience everything that everyone else experiences, and it is those experiences that feed the work that we produce. And I don't think that government is going to stop. And maybe if we feel the pinch harder, then we we'll wake up and start to think that, OK, maybe I, I, I don't need to say, me, I'm not into those politics. I'm not into political things. Because politics will come to you at home uh, where you are. So that's, that's my hope, that it will reach a point where everyone will just uh, wake up. Um, my brother from Nigeria talked about the, what I'll call the glorification of, uh, of the outsider. It happens here as well. And from in the arts, in the art spaces, um, you will not oftentimes not be considered successful until uh, a successful uh, or a recognized artist from the West has, you know, bestowed their blessing upon you. Uh, why are we all raving about Jint right now? Jint was published here in Africa, in East Africa, in neighboring Kenya before it went abroad. But we needed to first get the endorsement of 
the outsider before we can start saying, wow, it's a great, it's a great novel. And if you remember what Taban yesterday said, that you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's one of the best works in 40 years. <laughs> Why does he say that? Because people like Taban, um, whose works I respect, but also who do not consider short stories that the Doreen Bainanas have written, the uh, Liliana Ujos have written, they don't consider that revolutionary enough until someone else from outside has con con conferred, you know, uh, greatness upon it, which is it's frustrating, but it's, 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 it happens. So that happens too in the art spaces. Finally, um, uh, pastors, artists, no, pastors, pastors are con men. <laughs> And women. <laughs> and men and women. Wow. Um, I mean, on that note, I'm going to you know, stop with the panel. But this year's theme is legacies. And I'm just going to pick on two artists in the audience. Sivia, you are a rapper. And Sunshine, you are a writer. So I'm just speaking on you, right? Um, and that's a bit of a moderate. <laughs> um, so, in, in, uh, you know, basically under this theme of legacies, what do you, as artists still, not in this panel, but as artists, what do you imagine your legacies to be? Or, and, you know, what are you working towards as artists for your, for your legacies? Funny story, I thought I should I ask this question to the authors of Otofanyer sometime. I put them on the spot and... Wow, Trisha. <laughs> I, I, I imagine that, well, the, the legacy of the arts and my writing will be a place where there are more, uh, there are more female characters that have not endured too much for them to be considered strong, where women are individuals, not a collective. And so I hope that my writing will produce freedom for women and give women a voice in, in not just books or, or short stories, but also in media spaces. There's a lot of questions I've been hearing about uh, fear, uh, writing, uh, and especially the situation, it brings me um, to one of my favorite quotes from Game of Thrones. Uh, um, back uh, in the first book, um, the little boy is brand is in front of uh, a, a, a runaway soldier who was about to be beheaded, and he asks his dad, "Is the man afraid?" And then his dad responds and says, he asked, he asked, the question was, um, can, can someone be afraid? Can someone be brave when they're afraid? And the response was, that's the only time that someone can be brave. brave. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, it's when you're afraid. So all the writers have been, have been asked this question about fear and whatnot. And that's really only counts. I just want to say that. But um, to your question, Legacy, how I see it is, um, firstly, it's, I feel like it, it, it comes down to me as a person finding um, how to live more heartily. You know, like a, a lot of us um, don't find that you're know, living on someone else's expectations, someone else's thoughts, and you know, just for me to come out and say that I'm a rapper, you can imagine what it was like to come home and say, I, I like rap. This is me trying to find my way to university and saying, this music thing is what I'm really like. And the legacy that I'm feeling now is that I'm inspired by a few other people. Um, um, through just being online talking to guys, I'm giving feedback to a lot of artists who reach out to me. And yeah, I'm just to test testify to that my little brother. You may know him as a suspect night too. I spied him here and there, and the next thing you know, last year he just won the album of the year. That's one small thing. From him seeing me writing raps in my room, 
And he's like, looks kind of cool. Let me try that. And he found his way to do that. For me, that's the limit of me. Find my own self and show people how to do it. Find themselves. That's in many ways. <laughs> Thank you so much for making the time on a Saturday evening and, and all of you for really just joining us. Um, I think that we're a very just, whew, difficult time, but you know, that we can navigate through music and through art and through just our own different spaces that we can begin to actually begin to, to do the work of the collective change. And so I hope that you will all live inspired. I hope that you will sort of not we can so disillusioned to believe that there's nothing that can't be done. And yeah, chapter four will continue to support work like this. And you know, we're very really excited to, to work with actors and with all of you. So thank you so much and I guess stay for the next thing.